Good morning, church. I uh, hope this morning finds you well. Uh, hope everyone uh, is, is safe and uh, out of harm's way from our recent uh, skirmish with uh, Hurricane Laura. Uh, just for a short time this morning, uh, turn your Bibles with me, if you would, to uh, the book of John in the New Bible. Uh, the book of John, chapter 6. Uh, verses 11 through 14. John chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. This morning, I'm going to be talking to us about small investments and big dividends. Small investments and big dividends. If you have it in your Bible, John chapter 6, verses verse 11, uh, the Bible says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to, to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that they had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that prophet that should come unto the world. Uh, this morning, uh, again, we're going to be talking from the subject small investments and big dividends. I uh, want to look at uh, four different uh, points uh, on this morning. Our first point is the following. Uh, and we go back up to uh, verse one of the same chapter. Verse one, uh, the following. Uh, Verse one points out the leaving of Jerusalem uh, of Christ and the disciples and the return to Galilee. Uh, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Verse two indicates that Jesus continues to show compassion to the sea. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. The multitude continually followed Jesus. The reason they kept following was because they continually saw signs. The Bible says in John 20 and 30 that Jesus performed a great number of miracles, which we have no record. In church, when you're going through something, you will seek a healing. Uh, whatever you have to do for that healing and wherever you have to go. Uh, no one wants to hurt. No one wants to have to go through anything. Uh, no, no one wants to feel pain. And when you do, you will seek out relief. Uh, I'm reminded of the pool at Bethesda, uh, a man that was uh, infirmed uh, 38 years. Uh, uh, he, he, he continued to, to seek out uh, a relief uh, from his pain and affliction. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the woman uh, with the issue of blood for 12 years, uh, spent, spent all she had uh, on, on, on doctors and, and physicians uh, to no avail. Uh, and neither one found comfort until they ran into a man named Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the fascinating features of Christ's early ministry was his way with crowds of people again and again. Uh, he's followed by multitudes or speaking to multitudes. He had followers before Twitter. He had followers before Facebook, and he was uh, uh, he was great even before Instagram, TikTok, and all those social media things. Jesus had these followers already. Verse three says, "Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples." And let's let's, let's look at the scene here. This was sometime in the spring because uh, we know that the Passover uh, was near. In Luke's account, the Bible says the day was wearing away. Sun was going down. So, so it was evening time. It was close to supper time. 
the folks have been outside all day. They've been following Jesus, walking, uh, and they're, they're probably hungry. Folks are starting to get hungry. And, and you look out, it says multitudes, there are thousands of people everywhere. And verse 5 indicates, uh, this is point 2, uh, the dilemma. Uh, verse 5 indicates an unsummoned crowd followed Jesus. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? These words convey that Jesus, his compassion, was not simply for man's lostness and sickness. He also has practical concern for the physical well-being of his children. He turns to Philip. For a course of action, you say, well, well, why does Christ have to ask uh, someone else uh, for a course of action? If anyone knew where to get food for the multitude that sought uh, Jesus, it would have been Philip. He was a local. He was a local boy. He he was from the area. Uh, Philip was from the neighborhood, the town of Bethesda, about nine miles away from the scene. Uh, Jesus was testing Philip to strengthen his faith. Philip's faith by asking for a human solution, knowing that there was none. Jesus highlighted the powerful and miraculous act that he was about to perform. Jesus knew the solution to the problem before it even involved Philip, as we learned from in verse 6. This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Matthew 6 and 8 reminds us, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you even ask them. Jesus wanted to see what Philip would say. He wanted to see what plan of action would feed this large crowd. But Philip, he would never forget this lesson. Verse 7 contains Philip's reply to Christ. Philip answered him, he said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. When Jesus asked Philip where they would buy a great amount of bread in verse 6, Philip started assessing the probable cost. He was the logical thinker of the group. Uh, he was the accountant. He, he was the dollars and cents man. He, his reply stresses the hopelessness of the situation judged by the small resources of the group. 200 denarii or eight months wages would not buy enough bread to give this crowd a little taste. Philip does not come up with a solution but points out the hopeless impossibility. Many times when we're going through something, we don't we, we don't come up with, 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 with solutions or we, we don't come up with ways to fix the problem. All we can see is, is, is the hopeless impossibility of, of whatever it is that stands before us. Jesus wanted to teach him that financial resources are not the most important. We can limit what God does in us by assuming what is and what is not possible. Is there some impossible task that you believe God wants you to do? Don't let your estimate of what God can't be done keep you from taking on the task. God can do the miraculous. Trust him to provide what you need. Point three, the solution. In verse eight and nine, we again encounter Andrew bringing someone to Jesus. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, uh, uh, there's a lad here. There's a little boy here that has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Five little pieces of bread and two little pieces of fish. In contrast to Philip's pessimism, Andrew presented a lad. Uh, Andrew was looking for a solution. He presented a lad who had volunteered his humble lunch, knowing it was not, uh, knowing it was not due, but at least it was something. It wouldn't do, but it was something. The disciples are contrasted with the youngster who brought what he had. They certainly had more resources than the boy, but they knew they didn't have enough. So they didn't offer anything at all. 
The boy gave what little he had, and it made all the difference. If we offer nothing to God, he'll have nothing to work with. But he could take what little we have and turn it into something great. In performing his miracles, Jesus uh, preferred to work through people. Here he took what a young child offered and used it to accomplish one of the most spectacular miracles recorded in the Gospels. Age is no barrier to Christ. Never think you're too young or too old to be of service to God. At certain times in life, we may feel insignificant. We may feel useless. Surrounded by people with greater talent than ours, we are tempted in our weak moments just to settle back and let somebody else do all the heavy lifting. We reason that what we have to offer won't make uh, much difference anyway. We forget the truth suggested by our Lord's use of the five loaves and the two small fish to feed a multitude. Each of us has something important to offer in his service. We are all important to God's service. Sir Michael Costa was conducting a rehearsal. He was a conductor in which the orchestra was joined by a great chorus. About halfway through the session, the trumpets blaring and the drums rolling uh, and the violin singing their rich melody. The piccolo player muttered to himself, what good am I doing? I might just as well not be playing. Nobody can hear me anyway. So he kept the instrument to his mouth, but he made no sound. He made no effort. Within moments, the conductor cried out, stop, stop. Where's the piccolo? It was missed by the most important person of all. It's much the same way with the use of our abilities for the Lord. Whether our talent is great or small, the performance is complete until we do our best with what God uh, we do our best with, with what we have. In God's eyes, it's a great thing to do a little thing for him. Now that Jesus has been given uh, something to work with, something to bless. In verse 10, Jesus take charge. Jesus said, have the men sit down. Even in this situation, there was cause to do things decent and in order. And when, 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 when Jesus asks of us to do anything, asks us to sit still, be steadfast. We should be steadfast uh, in, in listening uh, contently uh, with uh, in, in great importance to what Christ is telling us to do. And I use the word steadfast because the Greek word for steadfast or standing firm uh, is hadraios, which literally means being seated, being settled, and firmly situated. There's a Greek word for letting nothing move you, which is amatakonados, and it carries the same basic idea, but with more intensity. It means being totally immobile and motionless, indicating that we should not even budge an inch from the will of God. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Men, look at the example here. Christ knows the importance uh, of the man and guided his family. For he had the men to sit down first, knowing that the family would follow. If we as men do those things that God asks of us to do, if we follow God, our family follows us, our families would be successful. Jesus has the disciples organize the people into city groups in order to minister to them. Apart from the women and children, there were 5,000 men. The total number would have been around 10,000 people. God gives in abundance. He's not a halfway God. Uh, he, he's not a stingy God. Uh, uh, he, he gives uh, with, with, with greatness. Uh, he gives with, with, with love. He gives with compassion. 
Uh, he takes whatever we can offer him in time and ability or resources and multiplies its effectiveness beyond our wildest dreams. If you take the first step in making yourself available to God, he will show you how greatly you can be used to advance the work of his kingdom. And now the results. When they were filled, in verse 12, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. One day, Jesus faced 5,000 hungry men, over 10,000 people total. Only by putting it into the Father's hands and breaking the five barley loaves and two fish into pieces uh, could he miraculously feed the multitude. And he refused to waste any leftover fragments. Not only did this miracle foreshadow Christ's brokenness on the cross, a breaking that would make the bread of life available to all, but it also speaks to me uh, of the brokenness that believers must experience if they are to be used by God. So church, we, we, we're, uh, we're going to go through some things. Uh, Bible tells us that man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Uh, also tells us don't don't think that don't think that these things are strange. The fiery trial that is about to try you. Uh, so being Christians, we're not immune from from pain. We're not immune from COVID nineteen. We're not immune from Hurricane Laura. Uh, we're not immune from uh, uh, President Trump. Uh, we, we're, we're not immune from the same troubles that uh, that plague the world. But we have a mediator between us and God. Uh, we have a mediator uh, named Christ, Jesus Christ, that, that, that died on the cross for our sins. Uh, uh, he believed, uh, shared his precious blood uh, that through him uh, we may live. And might have life everlasting. Uh, church, although some things lose their usefulness once they're broken, there are many things that become more useful when broken. Two of these are broken loaves and broken lives. If you yield the fragments of your life to God, he'll not waste a crumb of what you're going through because broken things become useful. In God's hands. God bless you on this morning, church. If you're not a member this morning, the Bible gives us plain instruction of what you need to do to become a member of the body of Christ. Hear God's word, believe, confess, repent of your sins, and be baptized for remission of your sins. And you will be added to the body of Christ. Church, God bless you on this morning. It's my hopeful and sincere uh, prayer that we'll soon uh, be together uh, once again. Uh, I miss the fellowship. I miss you and I love you. God bless you on this morning. Thank you so much.